Guys, welcome back to another episode of Let's Be Frank, the Men's Mental Health Podcast, the home of men's mental health. I'm your host, Jack Coward, along with Mr. Ryan Smith, and today we have a very special guest joining us. But before we dive into the conversation, let's take a moment to acknowledge the importance of mental health, especially when it comes to men. In a world where stigma is still around the topic of men's mental health, it's crucial to create a safe space for open and honest discussions. That is exactly what we aim to do here on Let's Be Frank. We're here to break down barriers, challenge society norms, and provide valuable insight into the emotional well-being of men. So today then, myself and Ryan are delighted to introduce our guest, Wendy Hodgkinson. Wendy is a suicide prevention facilitator for the Derby and Derbyshire Suicide Prevention Programme. With her expertise and dedication, Wendy has been working tirelessly to raise awareness, support individuals in crisis, and prevent suicide in our local communities. Wendy, welcome. How are you? Uh, it, first of all, it's an honour to have you back and uh, on the show. How are you? I'm really good at the moment. Thank you very much. I had a brilliant week. Been down to London and bagged myself a little award. And um, yeah, it's been a great week. Great sort of uh, Derbyshire Community Health Service in the wider Derbyshire system shows that we're sort of on the right track with mental health and suicide prevention. It's incredible, and we will be diving into that straight away. And uh, but before we jump into that, and before we jump into a series of questions that myself and Ryan have got with uh, for you, even and to talk about the award, something we we'll always do on the show is to check in with the one and only Mr. Ryan Smith, old buddy, old chum, old pal. How you know are you doing, I'm, mate? I'm in my cupboard, mate. I've got a little fan next to me that I've been told I can't use because it makes a buzz noise, and we all know Jack doesn't like his editing. It's too loud, mate. Too and loud. I'm, I'm cooking. In my I'm absolutely cooking. So I've got my studio light above me. I don't know. But other than that, I've filled up on a, a all you can eat Chinese today. Um, not that you can tell, um, you know, with my slimness and everything. But do you know what? I'm all good. I'm all good. It's great to hear, mate. It's great to hear. And I don't know what the weather's been like for you, but here it's been like 31 degrees. You know I'm no good in the heat. That is one of my big triggers. So today, with all the kids here. More than one dog because we're now dog sitting for the other half, or my mum in law, pretty much. It's been an emotional roller coaster today, mate, to say the very least. Okay, that's uh, it, and it? it's unfortunately yeah, it's, the, the sun yeah, is out still. Sun's, is it, and is I'm it going to bed just after. before we move on, though? Wendy, sorry, <laughs> is it one of those with you, Jack? Guns out, guns out. Is that what it is? No, no, mate, not no. anymore. Uh, it used to be back in the day, sun's out, guns yeah. out. Um, but now it's like just sun's out, get in the shade because yeah. I burn. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of thing I roll with, mate, Fantastic to be fair. Um, but Wendy, coming back to you, I want to jump in and, you know, your work is truly inspiring and we appreciate the crucial role that you play in suicide prevention. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Derby and Derbyshire Suicide Prevention Programme and the impact it's having at the moment on the local community? Okay, so uh, the Derby and Derbyshire Suicide Prevention Programme uh, started about 14 months ago with myself and Kath Rowe. Uh, Kath takes care of the strategic side and I'm sort of a man on the road running. Um, and, and this came about because I've worked in an urgent treatment centre for about 13 years and I was at the front desk and saw people coming in. So, you know, we'd do a little bit of safe to wait to make sure they were safe to wait in the corridor. And I was quite astounded by the amount of men that came in with poor mental health and didn't know where to go, didn't know who to talk to. And it, it kind of got me a bit wound up, really, because there was no proper pathway. And, I mean, that's not criticising any of the services or anything like that. It's just that the overwhelming amount of people that are going through mental health problems and so at the time I was a staff governor so had access to like the exec team and so our medical director then who was Rick Meredith and I sat at the Whitworth and said right we need to do something and at that time my uh, nephew's best friend had ended his life and um, I saw kind of the devastation in the community and we've had quite one or two in, in, the, in the Matlock area in particular and it made me think we need to do more. So I went to see them and said, look, can we start doing a bit of an initiative uh, in Derbyshire Community Health Service? And that put me in touch with James Cregan from Derby and Derbyshire uh, Suicide Prevention Forum. 
And so between us, sort of, we've, we've got this role going now where I work within a Derbyshire Community Health Service, but I also am part of the Derby and Derbyshire Suicide, Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Team. So it's a really joined up, really joined up um, role. And the latest thing we've been doing, which I'm absolutely thrilled about, is we've been going into Derby College to the students, construction and farming. Now, what are they? Mainly men. I mean, obviously, we don't have to be sexist here because there are young ladies who want to go into farming and, and, and construction and everything. And we've done, uh, I would say, about 300 students in the last month. I, I mean, I've never been in a classroom before and been like a proper, please, Miss Teacher. So it was it was a new one for me as well. And I was shocked to, that they had no idea of how they could get help. So as well as my presentation, which, which revolves around uh, spotting the signs, where you can go, some data, because I always think statistics really smack hard. So if you tell you know a group of young men that 6,000 people a year die by suicide and that the highest percentage is males, then it kind of makes them sit up and listen. And so by the end of the couple of weeks, I did... Uh, um, Broomfield College and also the Hudson Building and so you know we we reached so many people it was untrue and then we had like a, an information desk in their heart space so that they could go in the lunch breaks pick up some leaflets because people are still a bit frightened about being seen to ask for help there is still quite a bit of stigma attached and you know guys like yourselves and, and people like bottled up blokes and mental and all those other people that are working on starting to smash that stigma stigma and i did actually go and have a very very lovely evening with the bottled up blokes in south normanton and one of the sort of questions i asked is does anybody in the room have any suicidal thoughts and what made me feel so good was they actually put the hands up and for me that's amazing that they've got that confidence yeah. to do that i mean i've been, i i get i I've attended a fair few of the uh, Bob meetings and I know Tim quite well. Um, he's a fr friend of the show. That, I mean, they're no longer doing podcasts, but we're becoming their voice for the podcast and stuff. So it kind of works and marries up. And, you know, we're really fortunate to have that relationship there. And I was, you know, I had my own reasons why I couldn't be there, but something that's really good about what they, the message that they bring across do you know what this is a circle for you guys this is you know if you want to put your hand up and say do you know what i'm not feeling great today i feel like i don't want to be here that's fine there's no judgment and that's the old ethos behind it and that's kind of our message as well don't be scared of the word suicide now something that i kind of you know i do want to kind of touch on and, and you kind of mentioned it a little bit um then you you know about about sort of signs and things like that now as a facilitator uh, uh you know as, as, I'll, I'll rephrase that as a suicide prevention facilitator Prevent. not a yeah. suicide, no <laughs> you know no, and yeah. we, we, we have got to laugh about these things you know we, we but but as a suicide sort of uh, prevention uh, prevention facilitator what's sort of the signs that you what what you would say to people these are what you need to be looking out for is there any sort of uh key indicators or or anything yeah, well, we start off with like looking for changes in behaviour, spotting those signs. Somebody might be normally a really buzzy, happy kind of guy or girl, and suddenly you realise they're starting to withdraw a bit, not answering the text messages. We've all got those friends on WhatsApp, you know, that get messages every day, and you realise they're not actually replying or withdrawing from social events. Somebody who might like, going bowling or swimming or whatever and it's like no I can't be bothered and things like oh, I'd be better off not here you know if you sort of hear those little flag words I'd, I'd better not you know I'd be better for everybody if I wasn't around uh, and, and generally you know being different yeah using drugs and alcohol huge one at the moment gambling another huge one at the moment and so just, you know, being aware and also not being afraid to actually ask your mate, are you OK today? Yeah. I mean, something for, for me, and this is talking from sort of personal experience. I mean, I went through a phase where I was down to the point where I didn't want to get out of bed. Um, and then one day I kind of 
perked up a little bit, not because I was feeling better, but because I kind of accepted the way I was feeling. And but I wanted that to, you know, kind of end. Leading up to somebody maybe taking their life, uh, you know, as dark as it sounds, and, and we, we do have to be frank about it. Would they go for are there cases and and is it common for somebody to go through sort of really dark depression where they don't want to do anything to all of a sudden a few days before getting lots of energy and, and being a bit more cheery because they're kind of accepting it and, and when I say I've said it to a few people and they go no that's not the case what's your kind of experience with that um well I do know of several people who in the period leading up to suicide that have put things right, so to speak, you know, left, um, been more affectionate with family, uh, done lots of, you know, little things that we wouldn't normally do and post-it notes on the fridge and all that. So I have a friend who lost somebody at Beachhead in, in, in Sussex and she'd been perfectly, you know, fine for a few days before and nobody had any idea. So sometimes, you know, as you say, that leads up those few days when they've got it sorted in their head, they can find that little bit of energy. But what our job is to do is to make sure that we find out before they get to that point where they've made that decision. And that is all around having the confidence to ask somebody, yeah. are you having suicidal thoughts? Instead of shimmying around, yeah. be direct yeah. and just say, are you, are you having suicidal thoughts? Why are we scared of that, though? Sorry no, to jump in. What, what, no. Why are we so scared to ask that direct question of like, I you, know, you, you know, your family member, your friends, yeah, work colleague, whoever it may be, is in that mindset or in that frame of mind to the suicide is there in, in front of them. Why, why are we so scared to go up to them and go, are you suicidal? Like, what is, what, what, what is it I can do to to change your mindset? Why, why is that barrier still there? That because stigma. I think people have got this misguided um, comprehension that actually, uh, if you ask somebody if they're suicidal, you're putting that thought in the head. And I've had this said to me a time or two, well, surely if you start asking them about suicide, to put that idea in the head. Well, if you look on the Samaritan's website, they will tell you that's an absolute myth. You know, sometimes it just gives that person that permission to unburden all that, you know, that's going on in the head to be able to say, well, actually, yes, and, and to try and get them that help. And we know it's not easy. We know it's not easy to get that help always. Um, anybody that's been through a mental health crisis will know that, you know, sometimes it isn't immediate. But if you've just started to peck away and get that person to start opening up and start uh, having those conversations. And, you know, a, a friend of mine actually did that on his way to um, Brighton. And he asked this young man on the train if he was OK. And this young man said, yes, he was fine. But my friend wasn't convinced so I asked him again by the end of the train journey he'd established he was actually intent on suicide but by having that conversation by him spending that little bit of time and we have got time I know people say oh we're busy it's too busy to do this but even surely you should never be busy and getting back to Jack um, it is the stigma it is because when I was younger as well you know you, you definitely uh, nobody talked about mental health. Nobody talked about suicide because it was considered a crime. And, and that's why it used to be commit suicide, whereas now it's not. Because what we're saying is it isn't actually a crime to end your life. So if you're a criminal and you burgle and you um, rob, but if you end your life by suicide, you're not a criminal. But back in the day, it was. And people didn't, you know, didn't want to tell the family that so-and-so had, had ended the life. It was, oh, you know... It gone away, or you know, dad of heart attack. Yeah. And this is still, and this is still where you know where where people. I've I've seen conversations on Twitter. You, well, you know, I'm quite, I, you know, I'm quite uh, proficient on Twitter. You know, I'm always putting stuff out on Twitter, and and you know, we we like it on Facebook the way way we we'll talk about it quite openly. And there was something that I seen which kind of drove me nuts, and it was a, a famous footballer talking about his mental health and how he felt suicide and how the stigma still there and the amount of comments that were there, there's no there's no stigma anymore there's there's no there's, you know it, 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 it's it's out there it's and that's why it's a stigma because you're associating that word stigma you know as a as a sort of that it doesn't exist type thing already that's putting up a barrier and and, and it's like if you like you've just said putting the words like committing there and um 
it, it, it kind of just changes the context and like you say it was a criminal record if somebody you know it was a class as a criminal you know a criminal act if you did that and, no and you couldn't be buried that's right you and, be buried, and it's, 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 it's the same as you know mental health and and this is draconian sort of ways of thinking Absolutely. Um, and 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 it's still prevalent today because of things that happened 20 years ago yes we talk about it more but today we had a young lad uh, messages in on facebook and he and he and it was i'm not going to mention his name or his age or something no, no. And it, but he was no. early 20s um and he just put in about you know he's, he's worried about the alpha male he's worried about this and he's worried about that and 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 this is the problem still today men are still being told you know that they can't do this and 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 it's taking things like what we're trying to do and you know i work with dcc so i kind of i know what your organization you do and things on you know with luke with joe and how all the fields cross over and it's absolutely amazing but it takes it's taking projects like ours projects like yours to break down them walls and how important are you know things like our show to getting people like yourself on how how important do you think it is to spread that education across Oh, massive. I think, you know, if you can get people listening in and understanding, and I mean, before the show, I, I jotted some things down, you know, just about wh where we're coming from with this. And like comments like, man up, don't be a wuss. Oh, you're a mamby pamby twit. You know, oh, because because you help your wife in, in the house. Oh, you, you know, you're under the thumb. And I mean, when I was younger, men didn't change nappies. They didn't go to the supermarket. They didn't. Honestly, oh, I've had three you? children, and I can tell you, nobody changed my children. <laughs> that do that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's because it was seen as a, yeah. a, a female thing to do. And I'm so glad I brought my sons up uh, to be amazing dads. You know, they do all that. They, you know, they change nappies, they give them the feed, they go shopping. Um, but when I was young, you, you, you'd literally be called a wuss or under the thumb. Yeah. And that's why things like what you're doing, what Bob's doing and Mantel are doing, are giving men that freedom to be able to be uh, like women have been all these years. I think, uh, I think on that is a case of finding the difference between banter and actual name saying. So again, in the uh, in 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 the army, we always used to use that under the farm. You're you're whipped. You know, we used that all the time. And and for us, it was very much a a banter way of of talking. Saying, "Are you going to come out the last night for Saint to eat? Are you going to come for a quick drink? Oh no, I've got to go home and look after you know, sort misses out, Barney. Blah. Oh, you're under the farm. And it was seen as uh, as banter. So I think what we what we need to do is, uh, somehow is not a not a, a case of right. We're now no longer uh, are allowed to say that because then people can take it in different ways. But it, it's again, it's educating and, and learning about the, the differences between someone actually going, you're under the farm, man the fuck up, sort your life out, and giving that stern approach to, to having that, that banter. Because some people will, will take it differently. There is a difference. I think there's a key difference. And I don't, I don't know if you'll agree with this one, Wendy, but I get where Jack's coming from. But on the flip side to that, I, a few years ago, I was having issues. Uh, I think it was about 2016, 17, 18. I was registered disabled. I was right down at the bottom. There was days I couldn't talk, couldn't walk. And I phoned my brother up one day. Um, and it was a day when it was a really bad day. And when I say I couldn't talk, my words were like, the, 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 and it, they thought I'd had a stroke at one point. And my mm. brother's words were, Ryan, we've all got our own problems. You just need to man the fuck up. Yeah, and, and that's, the, that's the difference, you know. There's, there's, there's saying in a jesting kind of way, but then there's, a, mm. there's a. But where, where do you, where do you cross the line? That, that's. I don't know. It's, it's a real. It's problem. always going to be. It, it is hard, isn't it? Because it's always going to be a personal uh, perception of that. Because so, I've had it. I remember when. I first got diagnosed with my PTSD. My dad didn't understand it. And my dad was like, you need to stay in the army. Like, you yeah. need to, there's nothing wrong with you. I'll sort yourself out. <laughs> my, my dad's old school. But because I, I I knew that was him, I didn't I don't take offense to it. So, again, it's how you interpret how people communicate. But it's got to be a way. Obviously, we're, we're talking about the misconceptions and, and, and the stigma mm. and that. So how can we break down these barriers and, you know, encourage people 
men and and, and women for now on, on the suicide front to, to open up the dialogue? I think we just have to keep doing what we're doing. I think, you know, like I say, guys like yourself, the pro the programme we're doing as well, which is like reaching out to other organisations and um, other companies and other NHS trusts, getting at the grassroots, getting them when they first get to work there, embedding suicide prevention like you do manual handling, like you do infection control. When we all do that when we first join the trust, and we've got such a great backing from, you know, from the top in DCHS to get that embedded. And also, you know, these um, conversations that we're having with people in colleges, universities, once we've done the NHS Trust and the organisation, we're going to go to bigger organisations, things like Rolls-Royce, hopefully, you know, all those that employ a lot of people. And just explain, you know, it's not wrong to talk about your mental health. Do you, do you think, though, with do you think we should be starting earlier than that? Well, I mean, I, you, you, if you know me well enough by now, you'll know that, you know, I think secondary school, you know, from 11 years onwards, I, I'm not quite so sure around very small children. The only thing is, I think, if somebody ends their life by suicide, how do you tell that? Child? Yeah, I, I, I think, I, I, I mean, I totally agree, you know, talking sort of high school around the, the cases of suicide. But again, I think teaching kids younger about, awareness of mental health not 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 suicide as such but awareness of uh, of mental health and it's okay to feel like this and it's okay to be down one day you might be up the next day and that's totally fine but being aware of it so when they get to high school and then you, you can talk about the suicide awareness and the prevention and then by the time they get into the workforces it's already second nature it should to them. Be embedded. yeah absolutely i think we just need to make sure that it's second nature for everybody yeah. And, you know, you listen to people like the three dads walking. Yeah, if you listen to them, how they had no idea, you know, it was like such a shock and how they've campaigned tirelessly this year, going to Parliament, getting it um, on the school curriculum. Yeah. And I know a lot of people don't agree, but I do. I think, yeah, get it on there. Yeah. The thing is, though, if you can teach, you know, sex education at such a young yeah, age and, you know, there is people out there now in their early teens who are falling pregnant, which is ridiculously stupid in my eyes, but that's just my own personal opinion, that there should be, at, at you know, early primary school, there should be teaching the kids about, you know, the different disabilities as such, so what is autism, what is, you know, Death and that, do you know what I mean? So they, because mm -hmm. that's when it starts all the very early bullying, bullying. Because again, they're confused, don't understand. And then as they come to the end of the primary school, right, this is mental health. Here's an overview of mental health. And so, again, as you say, once you go into high school, you should then be taught this is mental health, this is suicide, this is anxiety, depression, you know, PTSD, whatever you want, all of it. So they can then ask the questions to their friends. They might spot it in their dad, in their mum. Yeah. And then it, it's not be afraid to talk about. We don't expect any. We don't. It, it's it's not okay. there for them to be professionals, gonna, isn't it? It's just for you to have an so awareness. I think you were it. just about to ask them, weren't you, Wendy? About so where where do you think we're going wrong? Is it or where where do you, what do you think? Well, we could no, be? It's, what I was going to say is why do you think the mental state of children is so bad? And it is. And again, it's like. They're not safe, are no. they, from bullying? No, they're, they're... That's my argument. They, they're coming home from school. And you see, when I was a young girl before this last Elvis and all that, <laughs> we always have a joke about it in our family. But when I was a young girl, my mum fetched me from school. We had our tea. And Dad came in from work. We all had a conversation. If you were get a bit of bullying at school, which we've all had. I mean, I had. I had a, a, a girl at school who positively hated me. And she was always giving me a bit of a slap. But when I got home, I hadn't got it at home. But now, with the internet and with tablets and phones and everything else, and there's not a lot of parental control all the time either. And that's what we've got to do is educate parents. Don't leave your child on, an in, on a tablet browsing and watching films that they should do. Get some parental control going. So Keep your children we, safe. We, we, I mean, we, we've... We've got young, young, young son now, but something we bought age uh, a while back. We were not a massive house. We bought, but we bought a table that fits in the lounge. So as he develops and grows, something that I will on 
adamant on doing is having a sit down a couple of times a week and having a family meal together. Because it, absolutely, it, it, yeah. Good luck when that comes, mate. Good luck when that comes. I've tried it, mate. Yeah, ain't yeah. 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 In, with one, that, you um, might be all right, mate. With my horde of an army, it is. Yeah, but I'm not. Work. I'm not going to have any more. That's, that's the beauty. of <laughs> Yeah, I know you're lucky. So, so do you talk to your children about it? About the mental health, then? Do you actually talk to your own children about mental health and what it I can't means? At the and... moment, Wendy. No, are they babies? Six weeks. <laughs> Six weeks. Six weeks. Oh, you haven't so I, yeah, so I've got a lot. So I, I've got five in total. So I've got two stepkids and I've got three of my own. My oldest is eight. So and he's on the spectrum uh, with a with, with he's on the spectrum of autism. He definitely got ADHD. Mm. And again, it's such a long period to get him kind of diagnosed. Um, so I'll speak to him because he's in that stage now where he's got a lot more understanding. So when they hit that seven, eight year old. Mm age that's the perfect time to go listen this is the world so today i, I took him home today and he was like i hate school i said like, well why do you hate school he's like, i'm being bullied i was like okay so tell me why a bit and it, it's hard for him because he doesn't know how to explain his emotions he his emotions is just rage like he'll smash up his room and that, that's just how he shows his emotions it's really frustrating but i got him to talk and it was a case of like there were some kids at school that were telling him to like shut the f up and to him that, that he was like, I'm, I'm being bullied it was like trying to explain to him, well, actually, in that situation, all you do is you just walk away to the other side of the field, you know, go and speak to a teacher, go and speak to this. And the one thing we've had to do because of his anger is try and explain to him, listen, you know, you're allowed to have these emotions, you're allowed to have these outbursts, but it's, it's how we then control, control these outbursts. Do you know what I mean? You can't, you can't go just because you're sad because something's not worked on a game or you're angry because you know there isn't a particular food on the table that you want just just little things that he, he picks up on it's like well this is what happens in your head when all this kind of happens and i kind of explained to him how like the chemical imbalance works and kind of why he has his mood swings and it's like right now you understand that a little bit here's how you control it so you know instead of hitting your mum in instead of trashing your room this is going to be your anger pillow so if you get angry you're allowed to hit the pillow that's the only thing you're allowed to hit is the pillow because we'd rather you hit the pillow than hit a wall hit a door hit your brother hit your mum so we are at, at that age of eight i think it's a perfect time to teach them uh, more about the world and mental health and well again, it, it is like, well, jack it is and i'll tell you for why it doesn't like i'll tell you for why because on my, I don't know if you have seen any of the papyrus's videos. So in my presentations, I use a lot of the papyrus um, videos because they're so good. You know, you've got your sinking feeling, which shows how, you know, you can get left out and you feel on your own. And this particular one was, what is age appropriate to talk to children about the mental health and suicide? And I was completely shocked to find that they've got kids as young as five and six with suicidal thoughts eight and that i was oh god and, and, and uh, you know it as a parent I, I find that complete and a grandmother you know i've got an 11 year old grandchild and for me the thought of them feeling so that they can't reach out for help and that's why i think it's important to get to schools I and mean, we've got some great work going on in Derbyshire schools we really have you've got your snap it uh you've got um our own school nurses and they do an awful lot around mental health and suicide the DCHS nurses do we've you know we've got a lot of work going on with them and uh, were you at the conference a few months ago that's where, navigating yeah, children's that's where we met. that was it uh, no, it was no. not. It was a conference. It was that um, yeah, all weather. Yeah, it was the other conference. Yeah. Sorry, I was a bit. No, yeah. it wasn't. No, not that one. <laughs> but yeah, and uh, you know that's fantastic. Getting all the schools. So on the back of that, I've been asked to go and do quite a bit of work with private schools that haven't got access to the Derbyshire County Council uh, school nurses and uh, our own DCHS school nurses. And they just want me to go in and take loads of literature and talk to parents about how they can keep the child safe. So every time we do something, whether it's a conference, whether it's the Navigating Children's Health or Think Fest or anything, it has a knock on effect. So we're reaching more and more people. And so the, the college work has come from 
doing some work with university students that were doing the med medical degree, you know, uh, wanted to be mental health nurses. So everything we're doing at the moment is having a fantastic ripple effect. And, you know, it goes without saying, you know, the Georgia Bird Foundation, Abby Scott, talking about mental health, getting people to using music um, for mental health. So we're, we're really lucky in Derbyshire. We have such a lot going on. And I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. I really am. No, it's, I mean, it, it's been a pretty... Because I speak to, you know, through the support networks in, in the council and stuff like that I speak to luke a fair, fair bit you know through that uh speak to joe and stuff and and, and i did a um behavior change set thing with her the other week which was brilliant um and i know the kind of work that you do but just to, just to obviously what when i saw you at eight it was it was i think it was around about august september time uh 1993 for me so yeah so I, I, and this is why I'm passionate about teaching kids about the mental health Absolutely. and understanding. And and I think I, you know, and this is one of the problems in today's society. And, and I might get I might I might get you know bl- blown away for this, but this is the problem when you get kids having kids having kids. There's no edu- there's no education there. You know, they, they, they haven't developed themselves, and unfortunately, unfortunately, it it breeds a, a culture of. Um, Put them in front of a laptop, put and 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 the, they do have the purposes, you know. Put them in front of a tablet, and they do have the purposes and, and whatnot. But still, like Jack does, having that conversation with his with his son breaks down the barriers and breaks down the stigma. So yes, it needs to start at school, but it also need the parents need educating. I was going to say it. everything, yeah. every education it doesn't matter it's sex education, it manners, everything, everything starts at home. And yes, I'm going to sound like a draconian old lady now, but, you know, for me, the fabric of society, it it started with mum and dad and children, happy family life. We'd no television. You know, well, we did we did have some television because um, we were fortunate enough, you know, we weren't short, short of money, which is why I was bullied. And, um, you know, it's um, people don't, people don't have that family. No. Life. No, and and and, and, and that doesn't mean there will be people that that there, there, there will be people now, and I'm gonna go on to their side because if I was I was just like, I was just listening then and I was like right I want to take myself away from let's be frank and let's listen as if I was a listener to listen to the show mm. and there'll be people out there now saying, um, oh Ryan it'll be you know it's easy for you to do you've got a six week old. That to you know to to sit down and take away the iPads and everything and to to have that family little happy family. But what about me where I'm working? You know, ten twelve hours a day. I've got three kids. I come home, they get fed, they go to bed. There'll be people out there because I that's what I do. I'm I'm out in the in the morning. My partner's like even now she's studying. The, the kids go to bed earlier so we can have some sort of us time. So there isn't always that time there to have a conversation. A lot of the time, we use the iPads as a distraction, so we can have a break from the running around, the screaming. So again, they do have the the, the uses. And I'm only coming at this from a different point of view because I know <laughs> there will, will be viewers that will be like, oh, yeah, "Hang on, man, it might be easy for you." Like, well, trust me, viewers, I'm in that position where it is not easy. I use the I use the iPads for the kids to watch, so I have five minutes before I lose my absolute. Well, I mean, obviously, everything's different. My partner does the same. Yeah. But when you do have that moment, when you can sit down, when you do see a change in your child, that's the moment where you, as a parent, you need to intervene. That's, that's, you then need to have that conversation. That's all I'm saying, and though, that's Jack, what we're on about. We're, that's exactly what, no. And again, that, that's what I knew you was, you were saying, but I yeah. wanted to put it from yeah, yeah, absolutely, a you perspective know. From, from me, where it actually, you know, I use the iPad all the bloody time. I'll put the kids, I'll get home at like half five, six o'clock recently. Jack, 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 uh, listen. We'll put the kids in bed at half six and we'll have an hour, me and Yaz, and then we'll go to bed early because we're, we're fucked because it's a long, long, yeah. long days. I'm but not again, saying... when you see the changes, then you talk, oh no, we're yeah. all, there, there was no bad from it. It was no. a case of just. I mean, my children, they, they, right. they all work. I mean, my son and his wife, they both work and, you know, the children go to nursery. But 
you know, it's about setting those boundaries, isn't it? I'm not talking that they shouldn't have iPads or they can't look at the phones. What I'm saying is it's about setting boundaries. It's about a balance you are allowed that works for your family. Balance. It's a balance that works well, yeah, for your family. Absolutely. Boundaries and balance. Because yeah. there, 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 there's kids out here that will see that are out here 10 after 10, 11 o'clock at night, biking and up then, the street, shouting their heads off. They're the ones that yeah, need to be reined in because yeah. they're the ones that are going to be Go the troublemakers in the future day, and have tired. to do and having kids at 12 they, years they old. They go to school the next day, they're tired, they get frustrated. And again, it co- creates that culture of where... The, and this is what I'm it saying. Is. It's, it's about finding that balance and about our education. And I think, you know, for that sort of... From the very sort of extreme end of the conversation to to suicide, to starting at home, it all it's all around one message. Having a conversation and being comfortable... Having, having a conversation. And being, being comfortable to say... Mom, I'm not okay today. Dad, I'm not okay today. Well, okay. No, and I like to think my kids yeah. felt like that. That you know, I was always open for them if they wanted to talk about anything like that. Um, anything around them. It's a simple thing of cards. That's another thing we do here is cards. We've bought them off Amazon, and they've got all the moods on. Like, I'm, I'm happy. I'm sad. I'm good. I'm hungry. I'm tired. And we use them, especially with Alfie. He's only he's just turned three yesterday, but even at nursery, he's having slight issues that you can see is slightly different but he is okay so at nursery at three years old they use these cards and they say to him how alfie how do you feel and he'll go i'm angry and they're like okay why are you angry i want that toy and it's teaching him to understand his emotions better and it works brilliant so we've brought him into the house so if he's running around trying to hit me it's like how do you feel and he'll be like i'm tired okay well let's just sit down for a minute and but it's it's fun in a way, and, and you found oh. that balance that works for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And was but there's a lot of people that won't try to yeah. find a balance. They'll just use excuses, and then that's when the drama happens. But Wendy, I want to come on to a, a another question for you, um, because there's going to be a lot of people out there who are going to feel either unsure or hesitant about reaching out to someone that they believe is at risk of suicide. What advice would you give to individuals who want to help but are kind of unsure on how to approach that situation or even what to say? Well, I think the main thing is to establish are you having suicidal thoughts? Is there anything I can do to help today? And having information at hand to know where to send. We've got fabulous like the 0800 number and you can ring that if, if you're worried about somebody. Same with the NSBA cars, National Suicide Prevention Alliance cars, and not everybody walks around with them. But there's so much available online today. And it is to just give them that time to talk, to talk through the what's happening. And sometimes it can be actually something like they've got into debt or they're doing drugs or they've got a drink problem or a relationship problem. So if you get to the root cause, and you can say, well, I can, you know, I could help you with that find out the nearest support group. It's all about connecting, connecting people with other people and not being afraid to have those conversations. And if we can get people to feel confident to have those conversations, we're halfway there, really. I mean, Ryan, if somebody would have asked you, would you have appreciated it? First or the second time? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, uh, yeah, so later, later then, and, and, and it is, it's, it's like a, you know, I screamed for help, um, and my wife recognised it. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, I did. I've not. You know, my wife has been very good. You know, she made me go to the doctors to get that help. Uh, to the point, but you know, it, for the way I look at that, that saved my life. But she was aware of it, uh, and she wasn't scared to ask that question. And, and ultimately, for me, it is about don't be scared of the word suicide, because. Oh, this is why you know we, we've got that all over the yeah. all over the county now. Yeah. You know, if you're having suicidal thoughts, posters with suicide on it, so that people, yeah, those let's chat benches, they're fantastic people that you know are lonely, and loneliness is another thing. You know, some people get isolated, and we found this with some of the work. You know, it's people who are isolated that don't know anybody, and let's face it, there's a lot of people coming into the country, there's a lot of people that don't know anyone speaking a different language or whatever, that are overwhelmed. And it's just being kind as well. Just be kind to people. Don't be, you know, judgmental, whatever it is that, that they're going through. Don't be judgmental. How do we 
how, how do we approach then those people that don't want to be spoken to? So, for example, obviously, you know, I, I know Ryan, as as you mentioned, he has been in that position twice. I've I've been there. I can I can visualize it now, being at that moment. And if someone had come up to me asking me questions, I would have seen red instantly. I wouldn't have welcomed the question because I was in that mindset, in that frame. So at that moment is if you see someone like that and you fear for a life, is it best to just ring like 999, ring the police and <laughs> hope they get there in time? Because again, I think you can't, just try and engage can't your physically audience. start tackling. It's, it's, mm. it's, 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 I have to admit that because there will be times where people are like that, that there will be very confrontational when they're in that mindset of suicide at that, you know, near the end of it. Because I know what I would have been if someone had asked me a question. Thankfully, during that process, I, I snapped myself out of it. But again, because what I don't, what I don't, what I want is for people to go and have that conversation. I want people to go and ask people if they see someone or know someone to ask that question. But I also want them to be careful in a way. I don't want them to get themselves in a, in a situation that then erupts into violence because there will be times like well, that. Obviously. So I think we have to also be careful in that aspect of. Well, you're talking here, though, Jack, really, about, you know, strangers. I mean, most of the people that we're talking about and encouraging to have these conversations may know somebody. Um, you wouldn't randomly, I don't think, walk up to a stranger in the street. You'd have to know that there was something not right. And then when they are, I mean, we've had one of our podiatrists, and it was, it was in our uh, bulletin, one of our podiatrists who was in our Suicide Prevention and Awareness Group at, at DCHS, and he was on his way to a house call and saw a young man on a bridge. So he did go up to him. I mean, he's not going to just drive past him and leave him to jump. And he did, and he talked him down. And he just said, come on, let, let's have a chat. And they did. They had a lovely chat. Meanwhile, he dialed 999. They could hear the conversation. They came with no flashing lights or anything like that because, you know, that's overpowering, overwhelming for somebody to have blue lights flashing everywhere so i think i think if we do what we're doing now and just encourage people to look out for the signs get chatting don't be afraid to use the word suicide familiarize yourself with what's out there what you can do to help somebody in a crisis you know there's all sorts of things you've got your stay alive app you get people to download that there's safety planning in there there's all the crisis team numbers so if you log on from Derbyshire, it'll give you the mental health crisis teams for Derbyshire or wherever you are, wherever your GPS signal picks up, there are the crisis lines for that area. And I think you're right, you can't just bulldoze your way in. But I think you've got to use a bit of initiative and we all have that bit of a gut and a bit of initiative. Um, and like you say, you don't want people going wading in, but then you, I don't think you're bored. I think it's about knowing your friends, knowing your relatives, knowing your colleagues at work. I mean, you know, I can tell when when my colleagues are off the game a bit. You can just tell people are different. I can tell, you know, with family members if the game's a bit off. It's it's, it's about knowing them. Isn't so that's it, it isn't it? it? It is about that awareness. You know, you you know the people that are around you. Um, you know, you know the people that you spend most of your time with. You know what they are they're like normally so if you know overnight they change okay they may have had a like a, a bill come in okay you can't help them maybe with a bill but you might be able to point them in the right direction this is the the real real beauty of sort of companies investing in mental health first aiders you know absolutely if, you know, and, and i think Again, even the smaller companies of three or four people have somebody there speak to a, a charity that provides, you know, training for mental health first aid because your workforce will benefit from it. And and it's and it's just having that sort of person at work where people can come to um, to say, um, you know, I'm a I'm a mental health first aider. I'm not here to judge you. But if you need to talk, know that I'm not a professional. However, I'm more than happy to listen to you. And what I can do at the end of it is, okay, we've spoken it through. How do you feel? Two, do you need that extra support? Now, here's some leaflets. Go and talk to them. If you need me to email somebody to give you a call, I can do that. 
and it, it, and uh, like I say, it's about familiarising people, being familiar with what's yeah. out there. God, Ryan, there's so much out there at the moment; it's unbelievable. But this is, you know, again, it, it, I, I, the, the more when me and Jack started this, we come into it bullet agate, and and we were like, "There's nothing out there. There's nothing out there." But the more we look into it, and the more mm. we dig and dig and dig, there is so much out there. It's just about turning that first rock over. Oh, absolutely. And I think the work that we're doing across the county as well is really important because we're going into organisations, we're getting the workforce um, not trained. I, I never call it training. I'm, I'm, I, I look at it as an awareness session. So you're giving people that information. Life education. It's almost, yeah, like being a teacher. Yeah, it's life education. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's life education. And and, and the, the more I do them, the more I realise we're on the right track. The more people I talk to and engage with, I realise that, you know, all they want sometimes is just somebody to listen. And this is what one or two of the guys said at Bob. They said, I said, what would you like to see? What would make, you know, life better for you? When you're at that point, when you're feeling like that, and the, all of them said exactly the same, I just want to feel listened to and, and understood and, and listened do you know, to. Do you know what? And this is something that I don't know why I like facilitation groups like such as such as Bob, and there's another one, Andy's Man Club, and there's there's lots more up and down the country, and they do all it is is men sitting down and talking because there's some stuff that a pride thing that I know my wife would listen, but I don't want to know my wife to know I'm, I'm hurting and, and, and things like that, you know, and, and going to groups like that really does help. And, and there's some cracking stories from Bob, um, but obviously, you know, what's said there is said there and it doesn't go anywhere. Well, absolutely. What's said in groups is confidential. Yeah, and, that's it, also, you know, and, that's, and that's, and that's, and that's the way it should be. But just know anybody's listening to this is if you go to these clubs, well, clubs, but things like Bottled Up Blokes, Andy's Man Club, and, and, and all the others out there. Men's Shed. Yeah, Men's Shed. Men's Shed good anything like that. You know, it, there's our Facebook group. Um, we, we're in the process of launching a dad's dad's Facebook group as well. Uh, you know, th and we are very, very strict that we will only allow posts that bring value, you know, and, and that's, not, yeah. that, that's not saying um, we don't want somebody to post, oh, he, he's a lucky frog. It will make you feel better, type thing. But what we're saying is, if you if you there's a video that you found that's helped you, post it in. If there's a conversation that you want to start, post it in. If you're feeling in a bad way, post it in. You know, you you know. We, but we, we we've had a few sales posts and we've shut them down straight away. We we have to authorize them anyway. But like I say, if it's going to bring something, um, whether it's going to benefit you personally or one of some of the in the group. Do you know what? That, that's what these things are there for. Yeah. And this, I mean, this is one of the reasons why kind of we're going into agricultural shows. Last year, um, we did Why Not Festival. Yeah. Huge reach there. You know, lots of young people um, struggling with the mental health. And they did. They came up and talked to us and they talked about how they felt and, you know, said it was great what we were doing and come over in the morning and had a natter with us. Uh, in particular for me, the rural country shows like Ash Over Show, Language Show, because we know that farmers struggle with the mental, mental health and they're not likely to say so. But by having a stall and, you know, Joe and, and myself and one or two of the others who did Ash Over Show said we were absolutely thrilled because we went out with our little uh, bum bags full of little resources and at first it's like, no, nah, I don't want one of them. And I said, oh, right, so, you know, you never feel a bit pissed off or, you, you know, you never feel a bit fed up and they're like, um, well, you know, it, it's wrong at the minute with struggling with the farming. And well, I said, yeah, but this is exactly what you need. You need to know what's out there. And then we went into one of the, the uh, tractor, you know, they go there with the big tractors and do corporate wine and tea and all that sort of thing. And we just left loads of leaflets in there. And, you know, the organisers said, what, fantastic, it was fantastic. So they were having conversations that they probably wouldn't have had before, you know, up in the moors on their own with nobody else around. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really good 
that, that we, we're reaching out and, and festivals and things and pride events. We're doing pride this year, Chesterfield and Derby again. So I'm looking forward to that because, again, we know that people, you know, in that LGBTQ plus group struggle with the mental health because there's still a lot. Of there's so much. There's there's so much going on generally in, in, in the world, in, in, in people's own own worlds and throughout the different cultures, race, sex, everything else. So there is so much going on. There will be so many people struggling and, and so many people will struggle to find that someone to speak at who will listen to them, who will have that conversation. And I, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful tonight that there'll be a lot of people that will listen to this podcast and will take solidarity in having the ability to then open up that conversation with friends, family, loved ones, whoever it may be, professionals, everyone's there to listen. So I just want to say a massive thank you to yourself, Wendy, for taking the time out of Sydney to come on and have a conversation with us. I love chatting with you. Talking to us about suicide prevention's. You know, you're always welcome on the show. You know that. And yeah, Ryan, I just wanted to, to, to just to say, have you got any final thoughts, feelings, questions for for Wendy before you finish off? As no, always, no, you know, it's just Wendy. It's just um, you know that the, 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 you the, everything that you're you're about and the, what you try and push forward is absolutely second to none and and you know as as somebody that's walked that path not once but several times and battled my own mental health and i know jack um you know has done this himself i just want to say thank you for that um again here we go here we go i love that i love at least once an episode no it does it's all it does every episode episode. good Um, good i'm glad to see it and, and for me, you know, Listen, fantastic. Ryan, mate, you've got release of emotions. We're men who are allowed to cry, right? Little man's in the background crying. Got to go do your daddy duties, mate. But no, this is this is what it's what it's about. Like last week, with you know, doing the the, the whole TV thing, we got emotional. I think that's the first time I've actually cried on it. So but we're yeah. allowed to, man. Oh, I do, I do Everyone all the time. Honestly, I do all the time I, when I speak. To people. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, thank you for for raising that awareness it really is appreciated um as a as a podcast we we have that mission you know we, we've got a, a global platform now you know we're privileged in in that sense um but if there's anything that we can kind of help with work on um keep us in mind because we're always on about driving our message forward for more men to speak up so um that's brilliant and and, and do you know what when i was on the stage on, on, on Wednesday, and they shouted me up for this award. I, I cried from the table yeah. right up to the thing, and you were supposed to sum up how you felt in three words. And I thought, how the actual can you sum it up? So have you got anything to say in three words? And I shouted as loud as I could, suicide is preventable. And everybody cheered. It was brilliant. Absolutely. So, again, uh, Jack... Thanks for being here, mate. It's appreciated. Wendy, you've been awesome. Um, well, guys, Thank sorry about the technical issues tonight. If you were expecting this on YouTube, yeah. I have record. I have I have recorded tonight, so um, uh, we're all good on that sense. All three of us have recorded, so this will be going out as a, as a podcast, and you will hear it. So, guys, thank you for uh, thank yous and apologies for those that wanted it on YouTube. We will we will look at a different uh, hosting platform for that in the future. Wendy, you're welcome on anytime we are you know um but guys from myself from jack and from our amazing guest wendy stand up speak out and use your voice